County met, will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this, bot, this public body has jurisdiction and any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals. To consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, to consult with staff, consultants, and other individuals about pending or potential litigation, and to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. Thank you. And I'm sorry, we should have first stood for the Pledge of Allegiance. I apologize. So let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And again, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Approval of agenda. I'd like to make, uh, approve the agenda with an amendment to remove 609, a board action item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from April 10th closed and open session? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Again, one of our favorite parts. Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to start off today with our Young Authors Contest for 2024, and I'd like to invite up Kelly Swidark. Teacher. A proud, te a proud teacher at Kennard, if you can't tell, they have their shirts on this evening. So the Upper Shore Literacy Council chapter. Shore Literacy Council Chapter of the State of Maryland Literacy Association congratulates the four winners representing Queen Anne's County in the 2024 Young Authors Contest. Each student delivered outstanding knowledge and passion for writing in their poetry and short story submissions that showcase the talent and hard work that Queen Anne's County Public School values. This is the contest's first year back from its hiatus due to COVID-19 and from Queen Anne's County alone. Over 100 students across grades 2 through 12 submitted their poems and short stories for consideration. The four Queen Anne's County Public Schools young authors we are celebrating tonight were recognized for their literacy achievements alongside other local finalists at the Young Authors Award Ceremony at the Sheridan Baltimore North Hotel on Wednesday, April 3rd. So first, we congratulate Emery Reynolds, a second grader at Graysonville Elementary School. <laughs> Emery is the only QACPS student to win an award for a short story. Emery's short story, The Bird's Party, is a charming tale of friendship. Congratulations, Emery. A young poet, Henry McCabe of Kennard Elementary School took first place for the fourth grade poetry category with his brilliant rhymes in his poem, Always Art. <laughs> Olive Martin, a sixth grader at Mattapique Middle School, moved the judges with her poem, The Mountain in Me. The piece, oh, mm -hmm. The piece is a beautiful work of both imagery and introspection. And finally, Queen Anne's County High School's own Zuzu Kuzmider made quite the impression with her his poem, Honeysuckle. Her melodic, poignant verses won her the category of 11th grade poetry. Congratulations to the 2024 QACPS Young Authors. So we're gonna go ahead and take a nice photo.
Thank you. And thank you to the parents, because I know that you're very proud out there like we are. I know it's a lot of hard work, so thank you so much for your support in that as well. We'll continue on with some of our other recognitions for this evening. Our first one is the Energizer Bunny. This award is given to a staff member who volunteers or who keeps on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial with Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys, who were not able to be here this evening, so we miss them. I'd like to invite up the, nominee, the person nominating, which was um, Ms. Carey from the principal of Kennard Elementary School. So if Michelle Carey would please come up. And if you, if you want to grab the, the bunny. <laughs> So Ms. The, the Energizer Bunny for this, much is, for this month is Allison Hall, Assistant Principal. She'll please come forward. So Mrs. Carey says, Mrs. Hall is so full of energy and exemplifies the keep on going attitude each and every day at Kennard Elementary School. From exhilarating morning announcements that get us pumped up for the day to managing our safety patrol, helping out with lunch duty, and the biggest task at hand right now, which is state testing. She does this all with a great attitude and a positive outlook to get it all done. She is a true energizer bunny that keeps on going. We appreciate her being one of our KES Tiger team members, so congratulations. We have two Spirit Awards tonight. So if Miss Carrie could stay up here, please. <laughs> Sorry. So the Spirit Award, this award is given to an individual or individuals who embody the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And our first Spirit Award for this month is Amy Bolin. <laughs> Miss Carrie says, Miss Bolin is so much KES spirit. She is never without a smile or kind words to motivate our team. Miss Bolin has been instrumental in leading our social committee, the team plans staff gatherings and various ways to celebrate the KES staff. She is a team player who always is willing to help out in whatever capacity. She can be seen at every KES event and definitely shows the KES spirit whenever found. Thank you so much for being the best KES tiger ever. I'd like to call up Principal Kenna, Principal of Centerville Middle School, for our second Spirit Award. <laughs> you might have to help me with pronunciation of last names. Z Zekian. Okay. So our second Spirit Award is Kara Zekian. Thank you for that. <laughs> Kara Zekian is a very important part of keeping spirits high at Centerville Middle School, whether it's baking cookies for the staff, crafting balloon arches for baby showers, of which there's been plenty this year, <laughs> supporting coworkers in need of some talk it through time or ce celebrating others' victories, both large and small. Kara is CMS spirit all the way. She truly makes CMS a happy place to work and she makes us all feel like we're doing this whole thing together. She's got the spirit. And the last set of awards, we do have two shining stars this evening. And so I will start, okay, you are on top. I was thinking maybe a second, you're good, you're good. Okay, so shining stars. These awards are presented to individuals in our school system who shine. Our first shining star has been nominated by Principal Kenna at Centerville Middle School and it's Kimberly Leavers. 
if she'll please come forward. Ms. Liebers is an integral part of Centerville Middle School community. Her boundless energy, positive attitude, and the ability to form relationships with students is amazing and very much appreciated. She puts her heart and soul into her job and is an asset to any classroom and the entire school. In addition to her regular duties this year, she has also created a news cruise club that meets before and after school. Ms. Kim manages that group of highly motivated and highly energetic students as they create the school newsletter, newspaper, the school yearbook, and a weekly newscast. She spends hours of her time editing video and articles so that the students' products really shine. As one of her students said, she is awesome and the most caring person in the school. Ms. Kim shines and helps us all shine at Centerville Middle School. Congratulations again. And our second shining star, if we could have um, Supervisor Amy Smith, please come forward. Our second shining star is Lisa Herkner, if she'll please come forward. <laughs> Ms. Harkner is being recognized as a shining star for being named one of the three state finalists for the 2024 Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching in Maryland. This state recognition is moving her forward to the National Review Committee. She's a third grade teacher at Graysonville Elementary School and has sele was selected for her outstanding candidate for this national award by the State Selection Committee. Lisa's dedication to her students and commitment to professional growth are truly commendable. It's evident that she's innovative with her teaching methods and her focus on providing unique learning experiences and making a significant impact on her students' education. Her willingness to continually learn and improve as well as her collaboration with her team are qualities that undoubtedly contribute to her success as an educator. Her efforts to foster critical thinking skills among her students are invaluable for their future success. She is undoubtedly a shining example of excellence in teaching. Congratulations again. agenda item is board involvement who would like to speak first I'll go um, so I did a got to do a couple of fun things um, I did the future chefs competition with dr. Salins and um, President Bennett that was really fun to watch all the kids cook and some of the dishes were amazing I never <laughs> a little recipe could turn out so amazing um, art scene I was blown away by just the talent of everyone that had something entered in. And then I was also able to attend um, the SMS orchestra and band concert the other night, which again was a great showing, so. I'll also comment on the Queen Anne's County uh, art scene. It was very impressive. It's what our students are doing and some of the things they're doing all the way from elementary school up to the high school to me was very impressive. Attended awards assembly at, at Centerville Elementary School 
uh, with my granddaughter. Uh, saw Dr. Kibler there. <laughs> uh, also, I'd like to thank our board members. This will be your last uh, time with us. It's been a pleasure having you reporting what's going on with the schools. I'm going to congratulate all the seniors that we graduated from Queen Anne's County High School and Kent Island High School in a few weeks. Congratulations and good luck on your future. And it was a pleasure working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, well done. I'm short this month. All right. Well, I too want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been uh, fun listening to all the updates. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I also went to that was yes, I, with the um, other judges, we were at the future <coughs> chef and it was tough. Um, I've never cooked salmon myself. Um, and that was an amazing dish that we that we had and uh, such the creativity and they were they, it was just amazing. I took all of my leftovers home. I didn't let them take it away. The art scene also just amazing. I, I was able to purchase a piece of art from uh, at Queen Anne's and very grateful. I just can't believe the talent that we have. I also wanted to congratulate Quinlan Justice. He, um, from the Maryland Business Roundtable for Educations, he got a Maryland Emerging Scholars Award, which is just huge. And um, so congratulations. If you happen to be watching Quinlan, I hope you're not, that you have something better to do, <laughs> but congratulations. Um, and I know that there has been a lot going around lately, obviously, about the budget. It's been hard. Um, so I just wanted to read a statement that we put together. Uh, it says the board recognizes that the budget outlook in Queen Anne's County Public Schools is concerning and challenging at this time. The blueprint <coughs> requirements, which became law in 2021, um, the funding cliff we've had, we had a lot of COVID grants and that has now come to an end, the, and the LEADS grants. And of course, we know the rising cost of doing business due to inflation. They're causing extreme budgetary challenges across the state um, in every single school district and of course, Queen Anne's County. We are doing our best to work within our current projected revenue from the state and county government. Just keeping in mind that the blueprint, the, a lot of the mandates, they're not funded by the state. They have to be done also with the district. And so you're talking about pre-K expansion, you're talking about a lot of things that cost a lot of money that's not funded by the state. So we're increasing budget lines where we need to so that we can meet these challenges, specifically the blueprint mandates. And while doing that, we project a 5.8 million dollar shortfall in fiscal year 2025. This is after our county government is anticipating giving us approximately 7% over maintenance of effort, which is the largest they've ever given us. To meet blueprint requirements and balance the budget, we will eliminate approximately 53 positions to save $5.3 million in salaries and put a freeze on our $500,000 line item for new textbooks in fiscal year 25. And I do want to say that we've asked the, the commissioners for an additional, well, for a total of 7.165 million above what they gave us last year. And that would help us to fund, if we got all of that, 20, 20 positions, which are our teacher specials. We know how important they are. They service the most um, struggling students that we have. And we know that they are vital to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. So we're, we have put that ask in there and that's what that money would be used for. Um, the following are some of the reasons why these cuts will be necessary. First, as I mentioned, inflation and the cost of doing business is a factor, but small in overall total uh, impact. Insurance costs are rising at a rate of six to 8% per year which equates to what is that $1 million approximately for, for every 6% it goes up. And it says for pillar one, which is part of the blueprint, the pre-K expansion grants allow us to set up classrooms and staff them initially, but the local budget needs to support them in subsequent years. In pillar two, increasing the starting teacher salary to $60,000 by July 1, 2026 is, cu is currently the costliest mandate. Compared to fiscal year 24, our starting teacher salary needs to increase by 16.8% in fiscal year 27 to meet this mandate. Salaries are subject to collective bargaining and it is challenging to meet this mandate while being fair to our experienced certif certif um, certificated staff in the same bargaining unit and while also keeping in mind salary increases for our other four bargaining units who are not mentioned in the blueprint. We have a roughly 3.7 million placeholder for salary enhancements in fiscal year 25 alone. 
Pillar three includes providing additional opportunities for dual enrollment. And we know how big that is and, and how many of our students utilize that. Many of them graduate with an associate's degree when they're coming out of high school. So the pillar three includes providing additional opportunities for dual enrollment. This underfunded mandate will be significantly over budget for the 2023-24 school year. As of today, our dual enrollment cost is estimated to be around $360,000 with a state share of only $200,000. In pillar four, we are bringing six currently grant funded positions, four multilingual teachers, and two multilingual support staff into the local operating budget. This will require approximately $578,000 additionally in our local operating budget in fiscal year 25 and beyond. The elimination of 53 positions will be felt across the district. Fortunately, we expect to eliminate the positions through attrition, both in resignations and retirements. In some cases, staff will need to shift positions and location. Class sizes will increase as a result of this decision. Additionally, we have math and reading specialists in our elementary and middle schools. And as I talked about, we want to keep these teachers position, these teacher specialists, and that's why we've done an additional ask. Unless funding is increased, these positions are at risk of being eliminated. It is important to understand these individuals will still have a position in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. It will just be in a different assignment. This will cause an unfortunate impact to students as these positions help to provide interventions to our struggling learners. Many people have also questioned the capital improvements going on within the district, asking why that money is not being diverted to fill the $5.8 million gap. Unfortunately, capital funds are completely different from operating costs. Capital funds come from bonded money that is paid back over many years. These funds are to be used on one-time costs that are not recurring. <clears throat> Improvement projects like the new roof on Ken Island High School fall under capital funds. The central office is being built with money with, cap, with county capital funds and could not be used in our operating budget. We will continue to work with our county government and stakeholders to implement the blueprint in Queen Anne's County Public Schools and build a budget that meets students' needs within the restraints of funding. Thank you. Student board members, after that, yes. I'll start. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. So today we had our interim reports emailed home, and then we also had a college and career signing day for seniors in the lobby, where we were all able to go and just, um, we were all able to announce where we were going to college and just socialize in the lobby and have a good time. On May 7th, um, the nursing class will have their pinning ceremony at 5 p.m. On May 8th, Queen Anne's County High School Jazz Band concert will occur at 6 p.m. On May 9th, we have our spring dance concert at 6 p.m. And then on May 15th, an engi the engineering capstone event in the will occur in the lobby and auditorium at 6 p.m. On May 16th, we have our senior awards night, 5.30 p.m. And then we also have our senior cap and gown distribution. On May 22nd and 23rd, we have our senior final exams. And then on May 24th, we have a 12 p.m. dismissal. On May 28th, we have graduation practice, our senior panoramic photo, senior luncheon, and baccalaureate at 6 p.m. On May 29th, we have our graduation ceremony at 10 a.m. And 9th and 10th and 11th graders will have their school virtual. And then May 31st is our rain date for the commencement ceremony at 10 a.m. That's all I have for this Thank month. you. All right, um, good evening, everyone. I would like to start off by thanking you all for giving me the opportunity of being part of this board. I've loved the experience and it's definitely prepared me for the future and educated me about like the workings of the board and the government. As for Ken Allen High School, we've been very busy and we are very busy as we wrap up the school year. Yesterday, us and QA were recognized as Purple Star Schools for outstanding achievement in supporting military students and their families. The art scene that we hosted was absolutely amazing and had a very good turnout. This week, we have lots of performing arts such as band, choir, and our dance company. As graduation is at the end of this month, we have many things planned for our seniors. On May 3rd, we have a prom promise assembly in which all of the seniors are able to be educated about how to stay safe and stay away from destructive decisions. May 11th is our actual prom, which is hosted at the beautiful Silver Swan venue. I'm very excited for that. Uh, between May, t May 6th and 10th, our school is participating in Mental Health Spirit Week in order to raise awareness of mental health issues. 
On May 15th, we will be hosting our Innovation Night, similar to QA, which is our capstone project for many of our STEM students. May 22nd is our Senior Awards Night, in which many seniors will be recognized for scholarships, academic achievements, and more. On May 29th, we have our practice graduation and our senior stroll, where students get to visit their elementary schools and like literally take a walk down memory lane. <laughs> And we are all very excited for May 30th because it is our senior graduation. Lastly, I'd like to thank you all again. It's truly been an honor to speak at these board meetings and I've loved every second. Thank you, very Mr. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. <coughs> yes, and um, ditto what the board has said. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and I wish you all the best in the next you. chapter of your life. Um, and ditto what the board said as it relates to all the great activities from the art mm. scenes to just uh, you know, all the food that was wonderful. But I do have to say that I probably had one of the most proud moments yesterday. I was invited to the State Board of Education, um, mm. which is in Baltimore through the Maryland Department of Education and to recognize um, some positive things here in our district. So the first recognition was at 9.30 in the morning and it was recognizing the blue ribbon schools that we have in the district this year. Um, so we had two blue ribbon schools out of a total of six in Maryland. That's that's bringing that's home the gold right there. Um, but it, it even gets even better than that. You know, you can't you think it, how do you top that? Well, in the afternoon, we were also recognized for two purple star schools, which are both of our high schools, out of eight in the in the wow. state of Maryland. Um, quite quite an accomplishment. The governor was there because it's a really big deal. Um, you know, our military families move quite a bit from school to school. On average, our military families move their students, their children every two to three years. So they're always getting acclimated to a new system. Um, and sometimes it's even from state to state and knowing that both of our high schools have started this process to where students, where credits mean the most in high school. And as you're moving as a junior or senior, that can be extremely challenging. And we have a plan of action to acclimate those students and make sure that we can get them to their requirements they need mm -hmm. to get their diploma. So kudos to both the high schools, to their leadership teams, and to their student base there. And also congratulations again to our two Blue Ribbon schools. It was a proud superintendent yeah. moment when you're standing among, you know, you're, you got half the pie and, and you're, <laughs> you're not quite as big as Montgomery County and Prince George's County and everything. So congratulations to everyone. Yeah, Job well awesome. done. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Congrats. That's, that is um, exciting. Anyone else want to add? Okay, it's now time for a, a public comment. We ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster and include their telephone numbers and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Statements to the board should reflect a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of school or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. First on the list, Alicia Barrett. Good evening. Unlike our federal government who runs things like they have a blank check, I realize that the board has to run things with a balanced budget. And unfortunately, you have to cut positions and services to make up for your deficit. And although I'm saddened by these cuts, I would like to address one in particular. You've decided to eliminate Sodexo as our food service provider to save on costs. I understand paying a management company is expensive, but what about the people that have served your children for all these years? Do you know the average age of your cafeteria workers in their 50s? We've worked here from 10, 20, even 30 years. So essentially, all of us have been terminated. And we have to personally pay to go get fingerprinted and background checked, apply, interview to get rehired. There will be one full-time cafeteria manager at each school. The rest have their choice to work 17 and a half hours or 25 hours per week. No holidays, no benefits, just straight up hourly wage, that's it. That's cutting many people five to seven hours per week. And to you, that might not seem like a lot, but to us, 
it is. It's the difference between being able to pay a gas or electric bill or not. Some people support their families while others use it to supplement their social security. And we all know that social security doesn't pay very well. We do our jobs because we love your kids. We like our jobs, but we also do it for a paycheck. So some of you might think, wow, hey, we're gonna get young people to work here for 25 hours and no benefits. Don't count on that at all. At the beginning of this year, my school lost four people and it took from August to December to get staff. And you wanna know who worked the 30 hours a week till we got staff? A lady that was in her 80s came back because she retired to work until we could find somebody in December. <laughs> you now essentially are in charge of setting up food service in-house. So I'm asking you, could you please include positions that are 30 hours per week? It doesn't hurt your bottom line and it will help out the people that have done this for years. And if you have any thoughts like, well, if you don't like it, get a new job. I would like you to go home, look at a picture of your mother or your grandmother and think of yourself saying, hey, I know you've worked here at Grandma for 20 years, but suck it up and go get a job at Taco Bell. So if you could, please think about it and include a 30-hour position. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Blanton. Hi. Good evening. It's me again. Uh, Chris Blanton, Churchill. Um, congratulations. Congratulations on the groundbreaking um, on your new ivory tower that cost the taxpayers $20 million. While our kids have been and are learning in unsafe trailers, and uh, you and the others that work in the ivory tower can look down upon the peasants that clearly mean nothing to you. If they meant something to you, you would have told the county and the state, hey, at this point, we don't need the funds for the new Board of Education building. We'd like to work with all of you to allocate those funds elsewhere. However, you move forward with the monstrosity that is entirely too expensive while continuing to blame it on the previous elected officials saying it was a done deal. I ask you, why do we vote you in if everything, everyone that gets elected just continues the same destructive path forward by blaming everything on the previous elected officials and our superintendent and not changing anything? You're supposed to speak on behalf of the voters and taxpayers of Queen Anne's County. I encourage you to find people who will agree with you uh, with this new building while our schools are in need of upgrades and expansions. Why is it that our, you, our elected officials, and the Board of Education employees can't work, uh, can't work out of trailers? How much money would that save? Oh, that's right. A few months back, Mr. Smith, our elected official, was concerned about the safety of the current BOE building because it did not have vestibules. This was said on the record at a BOE meeting. So if you are worried about vestibules for safety, I ask you, how many vestibules do the trailers that our kids and educators learn and teach in have? I'm pretty sure that number is zero. Our superintendent said at a school safety meeting that the schools were built in the 50s and weren't designed for the violence that we're seeing nowadays. A little bit of history that I would assume someone educated making that statement would know is the first documented massacre in the U.S. predates America's independence and happened in 1764. The first documented school shooting was 1853. These acts of violence have been going on since well before these schools were built. Maybe it's just school board and superintendent after school board and superintendent continue to make excuses and pass the buck and blaming it on the previous group while continuing to make poor decisions that don't actually benefit the educators and children. I asked you if the new BOE building wasn't built, would that affect our kids? That answer is no. However, if we don't add on to the schools and get more teachers to teach all the new kids that continue to flood into Queen Anne's County, that would have a devastating effect. But hey, build the ivory tower, that's a phenomenal idea. You know, if there was 100 people that work in that building, which I'm sure there's less, that means that a cost is $200,000 per employee. At $50,000 per an employee, you could pay 50 employees for four years on $20 million. However, instead of keeping employees, you're axing 54 positions. Bravo. It's a shame that some kids can't get into pre-K program because we don't have the room or staff. However, we're building a $20 million administrative building. If the trailers are good enough and safe enough for the children and educators, then they should have been good enough for you. Um, I, I, I will also add that I did speak uh, with Mr. Sabori and I think he's fantastic for the job. I think he's probably the only reason that this school can probably move forward in a safe manner. And I assure you, if that man was given $20 million, I promise you, you'd probably have the safest schools in the country. Thank you. Thank you.
sorry, uh, Alyssa Schultz. Good evening. Good evening. I came to speak today to advocate as a current student in, Qu in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I attend Ken Island High School and wanted to comment on the county's decision to reduce teaching staff due to budgeting because this will affect students too. I want to experience, I want to express how this is affecting me personally before I get into my question. I'm one of the students that the budget is affecting significantly. My all-time favorite teacher that I had for geometry and honors algebra 2 for both semesters during my sophomore year is being moved due to the budget. The reason this is so upsetting was I, supposed to, I was supposed to have an internship with her next year and now it's gone and I've been helping during her classes this entire year during my free time and next year I was supposed to help out with the students by tutoring them and doing work with small groups. This teacher not only helped me learn, she helped me mature and she helped me push through some of my hardest episodes I went through as I struggled with my mental health. This teacher has very little clue of how much she's generally helped me through high school, and she's the main reason I want to come to school every day, and I'm beyond grateful for her, and now she's gone. And I do understand the budget is a challenge, and the, that the commissioners have helped really supported our schools, and I can't save this teacher's job. However, I feel it's important to be heard and wanted to share how this affected me and potentially other students. But I want to know how are we going to support the existing teachers, because these classes sizes will increase because, because of the student-to-teacher ratios. So... My question is, what resources or support will they have to uh, that available to learn how to handle bigger classes if they need to be? So during this session is when you talk, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily answer. Okay. We, if you want to submit that question, we will respond to you with an email or a phone call, but we will respond, but it will not be right now during the session. Okay. But I also want to add on to his is, there is literally a teacher shortage around the whole entire nation. Cutting teachers is just going to make the problem worse. But thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thank Alicia. you. Cecilia Mitchell. Cody came and would come and read to my class, and he's like a rock star. They're like, <laughs> Cody's coming, Cody's coming. It's like, well, Cody needs to go, but that's okay. So good luck to you. Thank you. So I'm Cecilia Mitchell. I'm the president of the Queen Anne's County Education Association, and this is somebody's bottle. Um, I actually had not planned on speaking tonight. I was coming in support of my most fabulous coworker, Lisa Herkner, who really is just an extraordinary person. I was lucky to work on her team some um, years back. And then thinking about her and the folks who were recognized this evening and the students and the students who step up to be leaders. Um, and then I looked at the county website for the commissioners and what they had uh, projected to authorize for us, which is less than what was being asked. Um, clearly, there's a human cost to that, um, which is unfortunate. But it's not a done deal. I'll keep my fingers crossed as we move forward, but the only way that anything is going to be repaired or restored is through comments from students that came tonight, families who come tonight. It is, and I'll speak directly to the folks at home, this is your school system. Your children are with us every day. You have trouble getting them in the car in the morning. We might have 30 kids in the room and we just want them to open a book. It's not an easy thing, and numbers matter, whether it's numbers on a ledger or numbers in a seat. So families, PTAs, students, please ask for what you deserve. Have our commissioners reflect our values and priorities and how they spend their dollars on the youngest members of their community. With regard to the blueprint, the blueprint had overwhelming public support when it was in, uh, brought forth back in 21. The governor vetoed it and it was overridden by the legislature and the legislature are the people. People support funding <coughs> in schools. So again, I ask the folks at home, please, please, please raise your voice and make a difference. So thank you. Thank you. That was the last name on the list. All right. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Can I get a motion for the HR report? Move that we approve the HR report and substitute bus driver report as submitted. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I believe that we're going to have Dr. Kibler. Is that correct for the 6.02? Um, okay. Apologies from um, Whitney Gast, who mm -hmm. is not able to be here this evening. She's actually participating in some professional development for grant um, grant reviews. And so my computer's not working right now. I'm trying to fill up the number. My apologies. Um, Do thank you. You're welcome. Very helpful. Uh -huh. <laughs> So on behalf of um, Ms. Gass, I come before the board this evening um, with the purpose to have the board waive our fund balance minimum requirements in order to balance the current year budget. Um, basically, uh, we request this board waiver for this school year from policy 305. The target range established in the general fund unassigned fund balance should not be less than 1% of an annual operating budget expenditures for subsequent physical year budgets and should not exceed 5%. And so this this waiver um, I, we're asking for is to go below the minimum of the 1%. Um, the board may ask, why are we having to do that? Well, we know that we're in some very challenging budget times this year currently, as well as subsequent years. Um, for this current school year, for this current school year, um, we had underestimated our insurance. That was a very large part of this. Um, but in addition to that, we've, we've had <coughs> several other things throughout the school year. And I'll, I'll start off by saying that um, for the first one was, if you'll stretch your mind back to right, basically the first day of school with the elevator at um, mm -hmm. Queen Anne's County High School. So things like that, and we've had a lot of that. We had a, a big deal here with our boiler here um, that was you know, a significant amount of money. So there's been several of those unique situations that have put us into this um, situation that we will need to um, utilize those fund balances to be able to balance the budget for the current year. So you might be asking, um, how will you restore those monies? Um, in the subsequent years, which obviously is challenging going into such a tight budget year. Um, the changes in food service will s save us money. We're looking at three to $400,000 there. We currently have a contract with Synergistics, um, which is really saving us overall about 20% of our utilities. Um, there's the blended virtual programming, which um, because of the law is sunsetting. So this will be the last year going into that. So we'll save some money there because we won't be serving all students. We'll only be serving a selected group of students. Um, we can still look at continuing to cut our textbooks, which is $500,000. So that would be going into the subsequent year. Um, and while we probably don't think that we're going to have a lot of um, salary lapse, we may have some salary lapse next year because of our administrators, basically, when you have administrators that are a higher level, retire and you bring in ones at a lesser level. Um, and then we always have some contingencies as it relates to different projects that may be going on through the district um, as it relates to maintenance throughout the school year that we may see some, some savings for. So we will do everything that we can to make a plan of action to start to rebuild that fund balance. But right. unfortunately, it's going to be necessary this year to utilize that to, <coughs> to balance the budget. So what I, just to, if I understand it right, this was in essence our savings. Um, but we, because we are such a bind financially, yes. budget with all these mandates, we are going to deplete our savings account yes. to help offset um, some of our um, places where we do right. funding. Right. right. So you, but we, you that we have plans to build our savings back up. So right. Well, so, you spoke of yeah. one too when you made your statement about dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. So we budgeted six. Right. We typically budgeted sixty thousand dollars a year for. Our dual enrollment this year we doubled that budget to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars thinking right that's reasonable we know it's going to go up it certainly shouldn't go up more than double and and the statement that you read we're estimating three hundred sixty thousand dollars so the discrepancy there and not knowing that you're not getting reimbursed that so those are some other mm -hmm. things that really have impacted our budget in a very negative way this year you know, I, and i think this board's been aware since september october that this was going to be a tough year and you know we knew we had some challenges in front of us so i think the way this is, is is appropriate to do right now 
but under five policy development review F, it, we should have a way to start replenishing the best way we can to get this fund balance between our one and five percent because it's prudent because we're a business we're a company running not to have a fund balance because so much can happen that could you know i mean one percent on our budget is a little over a million dollars uh so to have that it might be a warm year it might be a cold year right you know all things affect um we have our transportation fuel right now might be reasonable but it could be up a dollar or two, mm -hmm. and that affects right. our buses. So um, it's not a good position to be in. I think it's a prudent thing to do, but I really want to make sure as every decision we make for the next year, you know, we look at trying to get this back, you know, to where we have a balance because um, that's why we have it. And we're using mm -hmm. this year because of that. But I right. think to put the next board in a position not to have any is, uh, is not a good one either. Agreed. And what's the current balance? On. In the fund balance. Oh, I'm so yeah, it's on there. Two point one, I believe. Two point one million. Two point one two nine. And I, I want to be very clear too. That is for the physical year this year, this ending year. June the thirtieth. That is not to subsidize because you do not want to use a fund balance for a reoccurring cost. Right. This is using for the balance. This current year's budget has no effect on next year's. And it'd be very irresponsible for this board to use a fund balance mm -hmm. that's a reoccurring cost because it's it's not a reoccurring income. So I want to make it very clear on that. Any other comments, questions? Okay. And make a motion we approve uh, uh, 602 fund balance requirement waiver. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That unanimous. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dr. Kibler. Do you want me to go down there? You can go wherever you would like to. Okay. <laughs> you can go down or you can stay uh, there. We can probably, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll stay here since I'm all right. if that's all right. So uh, Dr. Matthew Kibler, Assistant Superintendent. So uh, I bring before you tonight a, um, a policy, an action item policy to be um, approved, some changes. Policy number 609, county-owned textbooks and materials. Uh, this was initially brought back in March by my predecessor. There had been no comments. Um, since it was brought forward and so seeking your approval to accept the changes. I will say there was a question last time about if this included computers. I did say I'd go back and look at other policies. There were no other policies in our accept acceptable use of technology policy about covering a computer. So I do believe that <coughs> computers would fall under this policy and they also, we have waivers and things when we hand out those. So. Because this is pertaining to the piece where it says to cover it Yes. When it's possible. Correct. When provided, okay. Yes. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. Can I get a motion? Make a motion to approve policy 609, county-owned textbooks and materials. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next policy, again, um, same sort of lead-in. This is uh, policy number 618 with field trips. Uh, we talked about this last time before before the in between the first read and the second read there was um, a public comment and we talked about it on page two of the policy to strike the word either uh, it just was redundant there so um, it now says students that have a medical diagnosis that requires supervision or intervention must have a parent family member attend uh, that that's the only um, change since we've had the first two readings okay then we have a question on if it's like a not a field trip but a, a, a sports event that might get back later that uh mr smith that's in the next policy okay right. God, i'm sorry you're okay yeah. you're just ahead trips. of yourself that's all right yeah no any <laughs> other comments i get a motion motion to approve the policy 618 subject to the final edits from for format and staff second all those in favor aye, aye. okay thank you and then the last policy is uh, policy 628. That is the overnight field trips policy. Uh, we, we spoke about the public comment. We didn't have it worked out. We had agreed that executive team would go back and look at it. So the way this reads now, it's under the definitions in A. Originally had we had this does not include late returning or early departing athletic trips. And again, the parent um, had suggested that that was uh, 
it wasn't expansive enough. So we struck the word athletic and just wrote late returning or <coughs> early, early departing trips. And then in parentheses gave a few examples of what that meant, but didn't um, have that et cetera in there. So athletics band has some examples. I just want to make the comment that I was thrilled that somebody wrote and did a comment, read it and made a comment. And because that's what we're looking for. We, right. I mean, we're doing these for you. Um, so it's wonderful when somebody actually reads and makes a comment. So thank you for that, whoever that was. That was great. Can I get a motion? If there was no other comments, sorry. Basically, motion policy uh, 628 overnight field trips. Approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, it might, is this correct that we're going into the interior painting mm -hmm. with Mr. Barraclaw, Bar okay. Hello. Hi. Good evening, President Bennett, Vice President Bent, board members, superintendent sailings, and executive team. My name is Daryl Barraclaw. I'm the school, school facility coordinator. I come before you this evening for a contract award for the Mattapique Middle School interior painting. Earlier this year, Queen Anne's County Public Schools prepared drawings and specifications <clears throat> and made them available in March 2024 to complete the interior painting of Mattapique Middle School. The project was advertised on eMaryland Marketplace with plans and specifications made available through Queen Anne's County Public Schools website. On 18 April 2024, bids were received with nine firms submitting bid packages. Shortly after the 2 p.m. deadline the submis for submission, QACPS staff opened and read each bid aloud. Island Contracting Incorporated did successfully complete Queen, An Queen Anne's County Public Schools pre-qualification process in order to submit a qualifying bid. Additionally, Queen Anne's County Public Schools staff has spoken to Island Contracting Incorporated. They have confirmed their bid amount of $91,200 and have provided the required letter of their surety confirming performance and material bonds that will be executed at the time of entering into a contract. I just have a question. They were so much lower than the majority of the bids. Uh, there's no hesitation or no concern that they're gonna be able to complete this. I, I did have a conversation. Believe me, my, I was concerned when I saw the numbers as well, but um, I did have a conversation with the owner of the firm. I asked him to confirm his number. He, he was good with the 91,200. Um, I looked at their qualifications. Uh, they've been in business for 16 years. Um, they carry double million dollar figures in an annual uh, contract uh, for, their, for their income. Um, they're able to provide the bonds. Um, I, I just kind of mark it up to the fact that, um, you know, contrary to doing these with job order contracts, we are putting it out on the streets. We're getting extremely good competition. We're getting, you know, nine bidders on a, on a painting project. Um, that's, that, that was kind of mind blowing just in of itself. So, yeah. you know, to see the, the range from 91,000 to uh, 300 and, Twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars was a little shocking, but um, you know, it's firm I think, fixed. Pardon? Firm fixed, like they can't. Yes, yes, this is a fixed price. With uh, obviously, if, if things are contrary to the drawings or specifications, there may be a change order. But um, you know, I, I, the only thing, the other thing, it is, is that um, the market does seem to be getting a little leaner out there. Projects are uh, not as heavily available as they were a year ago. So um, I think there's a, a bunch of different factors at play here. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Make a motion that we approve 6-06 uh, Manapeak Middle School Interior Painting Bid Award to, oh hell, I just went off the wrong one. Here you go. Uh, mm -hmm. Island Contracting for 91,200. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Next. Thank you. Yes. Okay, next item is uh, Mattapique Elementary School Final Tile Floor Replacement Bid Award. Um, similar to the interior painting project, uh, Queen Anne's County Public School prepared in-house drawings and specifications, and they were made available for bid in March of 2024. Um, the project was advertised on eMaryland Marketplace with plans and specifications made available through our website. On 
09 April 24, bids were received with four firms submitting bid packages. Shortly after the 2 p.m. deadline for submission, QACPS staff opened and read aloud each bid. LNR Enterprises Incorporated has successfully completed the QACPS pre-qualification process in order to submit a qualifying bid. Additionally, QACPS staff has spoken with LNR and they have confirmed their bid amount of $183,444 and have provided the required letter of surety confirming that they can provide the performance and material bonds at the time of executing a contract. Questions? No, the same same issue. It's a crazy how different. I mean, up to four hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars. Are some of these? Are there? Is there a real disparity in these bids for the the size of the companies? Because maybe they just is it just a large overhead? Maybe is a possibility as well when you have a larger. Well, I I can speak to L and R from personal experience. Um, I've dealt with them in my prior positions as, a, as an architect in at uh, K through 12 architectural firms. And I've probably worked on, worked on about four or five projects with them and they were full complete school projects. So um, I, I know he's got the horsepower to do it and he can, he can do a good job. And I, I feel really comfortable with, with, with LNR. And, right. and being in business, sometimes companies are in different positions. They're not gonna put no bid, but they're gonna say, you know, we only have so much time. It's going to be half our guys going to be in overtime doing something or something. So some can look a little high sometimes. It's really, they just, they'll take it if you give them that much money, but it's not something they're really looking for right at this period of time. Yeah, if they've got work already scheduled, they're not going to hire crews, but they'll take it at a, at a higher um, profit margin. Okay, any other comments, questions? I get a motion? Motion. motion. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> motion for the approval of the contract construction contract to LNR Enterprise to complete the final <coughs> tile floor replacement at Mad Peak Elementary School. Fiscal impact $183,447. Budget source local capital funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, and next. Last item a uh, bid award for Queen Anne's County High School Stadium light replacement. Um, utilizing the Keystone Purchase Network Master Project Contract KPN 201901-01 Cooperative Purchasing Agreement, Musco Sports Lighting LLC shall provide materials including stadium luminaries, wiring cables, control wiring disconnects, and other related compo components for the complete upgrade of the stadium field lighting with installation by others under a separate purchase order. Funding for this project will be through FY25 local funds that will be available July 1, 24. Questions? The question I have is, they're doing the materials. Correct. Somebody else can do the installation. Correct. Warranty work mm -hmm. and how do we coordinate to make sure the, I'm blaming Helen for the materials and she's blaming me for the work. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would run all of that through Musco because Musco is, is um, they vetted the three contractors that they got electrical pricing from. So they're, they've kind of, part of the reason why we're going a cooperative purchasing agreement on this, um, there's several factors at play here. Number one, um, Musco did this as a design build. So they're going out and they're soliciting the electricians. They're telling them what work needs to happen, what the scope is and all of that. If we were to competitively bid this like we did the floors and the painting, we would have to hire an engineering firm and obviously there's costs with doing that and then we would have to bid it out. Musco is, I believe, the only sports lighting company that is around to do the work. So Musco would get the bid and, and I'd be before you with probably a, a bid amount that would be significantly higher and cost would be higher with that. So whoever does electrical or the next part of it will be will be bid through Musco and they will they will be approved. So. I just remember sometimes, and maybe Mr. Pender can t say, but you, know, you get an air conditioner unit and it's not Johnson Control and everything mm -hmm. else is Johnson Control. Well, I want to make sure that, you know, we, we know who we're talking to. Yeah, well, I, you, not me. You yeah, guys are what's no, going to do no, with the problem. And I, I feel comfortable with okay. this. Musco, um, they've vetted the electrician, and, and I don't mean to, to dumb down the installation. I mean, they're, they're, they're pulling the wire and doing the connections. So Musco, is, Musco are the ones that are doing all of the programming and supplying the, the large the large materials. Um, and you'll see um, with the packet that I provided for the board, the three prices that 
were uh, solicited from the electricians, and we are going to utilize the lowest, um, the lowest of the three, um, and get my number straight. It's forty-nine thousand dollars was their cost. Uh, that that's what we would be writing a purchase order for them. So since that's below the fifty thousand dollar threshold, we won't be before you seeking approval for that because you know again it's below that. Something 000. that low is as, as possible of a local contractor getting that. Pardon? Being that low, is it a project some local contractor can do? A Queens County electrician? Um, it uh, the contractor that would be doing it is Dalton Electric Installation, and I believe they're uh, east. Uh, I believe they're over here on the shore somewhere. Because you said that Musco worked with three. They had contact. They correct. And that's with three electricians. And they picked the Dalton. Well, he provided the numbers for all three to, to, to okay. kind of let us see that he did price it out and, and let us choose. He obviously let us choose whichever one we wanted to go with, but okay. obviously we went with the, the lowest bid. All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions? We had a motion. Make a motion to approve 608 Queens County Stadium Lighting Replacement Contract Award, materials only. Hold on. The Musco Sports Lighting. In the, for the sum of, yeah, $237,688. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Good, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, per the beginning, we have, um, we are not doing 6.09, so we will start with Dr. Kibler on the second read. Policy 102. All right, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Right. So good evening again, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members and executive team. So I have the second read of the uh, charter school policy, uh, policy 102. Um, there has been no public comment. Uh, I just would remind everyone that last time when we brought this policy um, or last month, really the changes are just reflective of language and laws in, in Comar um, that are required in our charter school policy. Any comments? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I did have a question. Yeah. The group that wanted to start the charter school, have we heard from them again? Sure, so they, so sort of another piece that happened in looking at this policy this year, our application that we have for charter schools had to be updated. Mm -hmm. And so as the group looked at what the application is and and the steps it would take to get the charter school up and running they they with withdrew at this time okay just thank you all right anything else uh, is it mr grove's going okay mr grove for second read of policy 642 good evening President Bennett, Vice President Ben, Dr. Salins, Dr. Kibler, <laughs> uh, members of the board, executive team, uh, John Grow. I am the supervisor of accountability here for the second read of policy 642, test administration and dissemination of test data. Um, during the first read, uh, summary is basically uh, update of language from past PARC, MSA, HSA, up to the um, most current MCAP, um, updated descriptions of our uh, current assessments, um, and links to um, our report card and, and so forth. Um, there have been no comments uh, since our first read. Uh, any questions or comments on anything? Anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a month. <laughs> All right. Is okay, Mr. Evans. Patiently waiting. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive committee. For the record, my name is Matt Evans, supervisor of student services. Before you tonight are three policies for the second read. The first is policy 508, behavior threat assessment. Um, to my knowledge, there have been no public comment at this time. 
Any questions? Balance. I have a comment on the policy 508, the behavior threat assessment. Yes. So I have a serious problem with this wording. So it says serious threats of violence stated against any person in the Queen Anne's County public schools community will not be tolerated. And the original wording said, and will be handled as a disciplinary infraction. That has been removed. And now we're saying considered for possible disciplinary infraction. So what we're essentially saying is Queen Anne's County public schools will tolerate serious <laughs> threats of violence. No. That's essentially what that reads. No, so ultimately, and in, in, in I did look at this for some time. So our student services team reviewed this. This is the only change in the policy. And then I had the school psychologist look at it as well. I know a concern is often, unfortunately, students in an emotional state say, I'm going to kill you and not and truly not mean it um, literally. And it sounds serious. So I think that is what they it was the reason for the change. Well, I think that I don't know if my board members agree with me, but I think that's changing handled as a disciplinary infraction, which a serious act of violence should be against any member in the school, child, teacher, educator, anyone. We're now saying considered for possible disciplinary infraction. That, that's that is kind of scary. <laughs> I would so, just add to I mean, just because it's, if it's somebody, as you were saying, the psychologist was saying, if it's someone who's having a, a, an emotional issue, because it does say that if they make that threat, but with the capacity of being able to carry it out or whatever, it seemed like that would address the issues that she's concerned with if there was a Yes, and, and the, the example that I gave, well, there are students that might even say it in jest, even though it's say, hey, that's a serious threat. I think that was the issue they took. Um, certainly, you know, a person who is saying it with meaning, absolutely, you know, we, we follow up with disciplinary action, but, you know, the, the purpose of this policy is certainly keeping students safe um, and having... Uh, a procedure for when students do make. Yeah, I'm not but, sure if oh, I. Uh, I don't. I, it doesn't read like that, and that's. Okay. I. I don't know if anybody if I, else agrees, but. Yeah, I'm not sure if I agree with that change either. The reason is, and I know kids, and adults do that uh, quite often. You know, I'm going to kill you, whatever. Um, but even if it's meant in jest, and if it's said out loud, or even if it's meant half seriously, or, or whatever, or it, maybe it means I'm just going to get back at you somehow, uh, not physically or anything like that, but you do make a threat like that, that can have consequences um, because people can end up harmed and the person who said that, uttered that, may not have been responsible for it, but if there's no other suspect, that person can become a suspect. So as kids, they need to learn, you don't throw those words around like that, even if you don't mean it, or if you half mean it, or you mean something else. And, you know, we talk about social emotional learning. I, th I think that's part of social uh, learning and it should be disciplined because you should learn that you just can't throw uh, phrases and uh, uh, um, threats like that out. So I'm not sure if that language should come out. If somebody I, wants to make a recommendation. And is, it's kind of just subjective too, because what do you consider a serious threat of violence? So I think that's the very reason that they uh, made that change because it can be subjective and there are students who who may utter that comment um that that it may not rise when it says a disciplinary infraction it would be a, a, an official office discipline referral well, um, I, which I, could I, mean, I can think of I, I can think of a very unique situation that we've had on multiple times in my career where we have a student who has a disability <clears throat> who it would be not considered a manifestation of their disability to be, or would be considered yeah. a manifestation of their disability. So I might have, I mean, Tourette's, I don't, you know, I'm, that, yeah. I'm using that as an example just because it's something that you, and we do have that. But I, I know I can think of several special education students who will utter threats of serious Ness and concern, but it's really part of their IEP. It's part of their disability and we cannot discipline them because of that, am, am I wrong Yes, no, that's that? a good point. That's correct. Because if it is a manifestation of their dis of their disability, then the discipline uh, process stops. Right. So that, that's the one that I think that? of right, right Can away. Can we bifurcate that in the mm -hmm. in the uh, policy and come up with language that if the student's <laughs> under an IEP, then there'll be any sort of discipline or whatever will be handled by their I mean, I, I, can, yeah. I can go with handled as, as a disciplinary infraction. If it's something in their IP, then that, then that would maybe exclude them from certain things because it's out of their scope of saying something. But consider for possible. I think, and I, to and me, I'm hardline. If, if somebody steps out of bounds, it's going to be handled in disciplinary action. We're not saying 
We're not in this policy doesn't say one day, ten days, you're automatically out. Right. Sure. It says it's going to be handled. Mm -hmm. So there's discretionary right there. But the first initial thing is don't do it. Yeah. So I can also when it says disciplinary action or what was it, official infraction. disciplinary? Infraction. 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 Possible disciplinary. Well, the, yeah. the former language. Then um, it will be handled as a disciplinary action. That can be anything from what? Detention? Or is it suspension? Or is it... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Matt. A, a disciplinary it? infraction would be an official office referral, which then goes into the student's discipline record. And would but be referral for what? I mean, it could be. And what's the, the low and the high there? Where the so the, the official a discipline referral goes in our, our data system, and is if that student were to transfer, that, that information follows. There are minor referrals. There's warnings, things like that, that aren't okay. part of the so official. So there could be warnings without a suspension. Correct. Yes, without, correct. And that would be given the circumstances, but yes. there should be some kind of... Yeah, I can also think of other, I mean, my mind's kind of going on what have we had come across our desk, you right. know, um, and I can also think of some of our youngest learners who don't, I think, really comprehend exactly what they're even saying. They might be mirroring or mimicking behaviors that they hear at home, but they really don't understand the consequences of um, what they're saying. And, you know, below second grade, typically looking at our pre-K students who may make a threat of some sort, but don't, sure. I think, even understand that they made the threat. So going a disciplinary action route on that's different, but creating a parent contact and creating a parent Thank relationship you. and trying to help the parent understand how to change that behavior, you know, at home so that it doesn't come to school is something that I think we've worked on. We wouldn't necessarily take that the route of quote unquote discipline where we would do a full formal referral with, you know, a suspension, which we, we can't even suspend kids under second grade anyways. But that's another example is our yes. youngest learners who may say things that they really don't even know because yeah, of course. They're, they're mimicking maybe older siblings or parents or things like that. Yeah, but as it was saying, it was handled as a disciplinary infraction. So like you were saying, it can be anything, including just you have a parent teacher conference. Right. Could that not, would that be a could that be a disciplinary um, if a disciplinary action is that you have a parent teacher conference? So that could be a disciplinary action. Right. But handled as a disciplinary infraction implies that action, it is an official that referral. That applies. What's the difference? A real difference between action and infraction? So it di well, that's a good question. Discipline is many times teaching students, as Dr. Salins was saying, you know, to have them understand the, the, the seriousness or, or the consequences of, of, of what they had just said. Um, that could still be disciplinary action, whereas a, a disciplinary infraction is like, that was wrong, where you're going to write a referral, this will be in, in your student record now. Well, but you're saying that the, in the record could just be that you had a warning. You can get a warning without having a referral. I'm sorry if I'm not being clear. Okay, I, yeah, I'm... So, I, so the, the referral is like an actual speeding ticket, let's say. Let's use that example mm -hmm. rather than a warning. Forever well, we don't say referral record. because referral right. isn't here either. It says handled as a disciplinary infraction. So I guess what we're asking, it seems like we're on some semantics here. What is, can okay. you explain to me the differences between um, referral, infraction, and action? So a referral, an office discipline referral is our formal document that is written up when the student has violated our discipline policy, which is next. Um, and, and basically there are a list of discipline infractions and with suggestions as to what consequences would be imposed. So, and, and it's maybe it's the way my brain's looking at it, but uh, certainly, and I think it was a school psychologist as well, a disciplinary infraction means that there is going to be documentation, written referral, and a consequence that's documented and then in the student's permanent. Okay. Maybe we need to do definitions and maybe a little bit differently, um, because I know we do find a lot of things when we're doing our policies, but I tend to lean with um, Ms. Capes and, and Mr. Schifanelli that I think that there has to be some kind of consequence, even if, the infraction action referral is you can't do that. Um, and how many and how what, how many students do we have that are on IEPs? Do you know offhand? About thirteen percent. Yeah. That's a huge amount of people that be, that we're going to give a pass to if they're if they act up. I wouldn't call it a pass, but um, I, we we followed the from consideration the, the federal law. Well, but we have but I think that a disciplinary infraction or infraction or referral maybe we have, need some definitions would cover all of that. We would, because you have a lot of leeway in the disciplinary actions, refractions or whatever. I think the bottom line is, mm -hmm. is that what this policy is trying to say is that 
if it stays the way that it is, then it absolutely goes in their file forever and ever and ever and never comes out. So if I'm a student and I'm in kindergarten and I say something that I don't even know what I'm saying, it goes in formally into our system, into a disciplinary file. It's reported to the state and forever follows that child. What you're trying to say is there might be some situations where we don't need to do that to a child and label a child and put it in there because of the situation around it, whether that child has an IEP, whether that child was young and didn't understand what they were saying. There's, is, is that? That is correct, okay. yes. So that, that's the difference. So, you know, so it goes into their, into their file until mm -hmm. 12th grade, right? They graduate and the file is not public. It's only for the school system, correct? It's confidential. For other school systems. And they're, I, yeah, I, I mean, think, they transfer but, them, they transfer the child, wherever they go. Right, wherever they go. whatever yeah. school they go to. Yeah, uh -huh. right. yeah. Not to university, if no, they join the military. And, 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 and we do get them summons to court, believe it or not, of on course. more occasions than you would think. Right, for different because, domestic right. type things. So. Exactly, and, um, and I think what we're trying to do is, uh, following this mentality of, you know, we don't want to make a pipeline, prison, high school to prison pipeline, whatever it is, by stigmatizing these kids and putting something in their official record. But I think to err on that side would be error because if there is, and I'm not talking about kindergarten, maybe we can, you know, at a certain grade level or, or whatever, or um, uh, it, it should go in the record because when he does go or she goes to another school uh, and it's not in their record or to another school within our system or, or I don't know if it follows them outside of the system, um, there may be, we won't be able to identify a pattern or a history of that. Mm -hmm. And so we're, I don't think we're doing a service to anybody, including because the Because how many of these kids, maybe these school systems couldn't identify because the previous school system didn't put what was in their record and what should have been. And maybe that kid, you know, we see all the violence that's going on. Maybe they would have had a heads up and been more aware. I mean, and I think we're not, you know, I'm not calling you an aim or whatever. This says serious threats of violence. So to me, the serious threat of violence isn't, you know, me coming in and saying, oh, my mom said this, or, you know, name calling between kids. A serious threat of violence is different than normal kid behavior. Yeah. So that needs to be. With intent, the intent's a big one too. You know, if you have a five-year-old who says, I wanna kick you in the shin. That yeah, I think legally you can't yeah. form intent yeah. Yeah. below a certain mm -hmm. age. Mr. Well, Evans, oh, Mr. Evans, maybe you can, it's before your superintendent's uh, stay, and it was with the, one time we got a report, and Queen Anne's County didn't have a referral for three years in a row. Every other county, and I don't know what report I was reading, I don't have it, so I'm hoping you might refresh my memory, but we had a report that no, we didn't have any referrals for three years. Every other county had them. I think you mean arrests, probably. Oh, no, this is well, this is I pretty remember, this is pretty simple. Yeah. I know we had a big deal with the arrests and, 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 and I'm that thinking, was all wrong. you know, remember that? I don't care how good you are. Yeah, in you three years, somebody's done something yeah. stupid. Yeah, yeah. I, there, we've never gone three Mr. years Smith. without a referral. No, There's, I can't get my that, that, thing on the door. Yeah, we're not going to go a month without a referral. Right. To be honest, so with I mean, you. I mean, that's realistic. I just, I must agree. I. Like Mark says, I don't want to put a pipeline to somebody, tattoo them for the rest of our lives because they did something. But if somebody is out of bounds, then it needs to be addressed. And I think we need to take it seriously. That's that, I would agree with that. Now, I don't know what the right Why thing to do is. Why don't you let us go back and, think and about it. revisit it and bring something next month? Okay. How about so, board council, if I can just ask council, it's appropriate for us to make recommendations, right? We can put those in writing. Um, we're not going to do it here in the meeting, I don't think. I don't think we're prepared, but we did have a good conversation. Is it um, appropriate for members to, for example, send me their recommendations or whatever, and then I can come up with some kind of something and, and present it to the superintendent, and then she can pass that to the, uh, yes. the well, policy well, We're on what, second read? Yes. yes. Yeah, so it's coming up okay. for- Okay, got one more before we're Okay, if, if we sit there and, 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 and want some changes, and you, you guys make them, then either we can vote it up or down, yeah, just because we bring it on and, three and then, reads then, doesn't then, mean then that you have to accept start it. Again. You right. could go on eight reads if you want. I mean, you, know, you could say right now it's... we would like to see the following language adjusted, and then and when it's in final, you expect to see that language. That and then, and then, then we could request at least two reads so the public gets to see it a little bit too. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we've done that before, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. sure. Your okay. policy on policies says that you can 
revisit a policy at any time for, for your purview or a citizen bringing it up too. Right. Because I'm all for, I mean, if, 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 if Mr. Evans had, you know, there's, there's people that had input on this that are professionals. We don't agree with this. It doesn't seem like it's a majority, but, you know, come back. But you're seeing, I guess you're getting a vibe of where we're coming from. I am. Um, and again, that's the only change, and it was recommended by the school psychologist. And, I, and now, when you gave your example of special education, I'm sure that's, that's where their, their mind yeah. was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. So I, I will bring this ahead. back to the school psychologist, and then on the final read, we'll decide if we want to make uh, the change well, or not. I think, I think we'll consolidate some decide. input and come up with some kind of language like we would like to see in the policy and then I'll pass that to the superintendent or we will. Sure. Okay. Okay. And I've got questions on 511. I don't know if we're there yet. Okay. And um, are we ready to move on to 511? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, to my knowledge, there are no public comments on that. This is 511 student discipline. Okay. And then I would like to make a recommendation too, and then maybe we can get input from the, the board. Um, Last time I had questions on paragraph F was taken out it's in its entirety, and that's the definition of the parent. And I'm going to recommend that that be put back in with a couple of changes. Um, and it was really bifurcated in the original policy. It had a definition of a parent, and then it had examples. I think there were pretty exclusive examples under the law. For example, guardianship, uh, any kind of legal caregiver, um, custodian, adoptive parent, biological parent, and foster parent, one through six, which were fine as, as they were. Um, but when I asked why the definition of parent had been taken out, um, I was informed that it wasn't in compliance with McKinney-Vento, the Education Assistance Improvement Program, or ACT. And uh, so I did review that. And I, I don't see anywhere where the original um, uh, definition of parent was not in compliance. In fact, there's no requirement that any definition of parent comply with the uh, McKinney-Vento. And in fact, McKinney-Vento doesn't even have a definition of parent, even though it mentions parent like 76 times or something like that. Um, so I was also informed that the reason it didn't comply with McKinney-Vento is because it wasn't inclusive enough. So what I propose is, and I sent this to the board members uh, beforehand, nobody with instructions not to respond, only for information purposes, and, and to the superintendent as well. So the de I'd like to reinstate paragraph F with the change to the definition. And uh, I went to the Oxford English Dictionary to look up a definition of parent. Full disclosure, there were some uh, definitions that applied to corporations, you know, parent company and that kind of thing, uh, animals other than humans. But there was a definition for parent in relation to human beings. And the definition is real simple. It's very inclusive. Uh, it says father or mother. So a student's, I would recommend that we change the definition of parent to a student's father or mother, comma, or any other person legally recognized as responsible for the student and strictly limited to any one of the following, semicolon. And then one through six will remain the same because these are all legally uh, uh, acceptable definitions under the Maryland family law article uh, and other articles as well so does that include students that uh, don't have any of the above so the definition of parent is it, it includes parents right it doesn't include students so students have parents students may not have parents uh, legally parents or guardians or custodians or their biological parents or dead etc but that's not what the definition is addressing, or that's not what this paragraph is addressing. It's the definition of a parent. So you, you see what I mean? We're not talking about a definition of a right. student who has no legal guardian or no foster parent or no biological parent but uh, that is that living. But isn't that why the paragraph was taken out to begin with so that it would be totally inclusive of all students? But, but you're, you're taking parent, parent out I'm, of... I'm not a, trying to take a parent out. What I'm saying No, is, but it, I'm saying this is for a student discipline policy. So correct. to remove parent, guardian, one through six, everything that was in there, that just seems because of <laughs> what Mark said that didn't even apply. Well, I didn't mean to have you cut off, so go ahead and finish the question. The, the, the question was, was the reason for parent being removed so that it would incorporate all students irregardless of their parental situation. Okay, I'll address that. 
parent, the definition of parent is defining what a parent is. It's not defining what a student who has no parent is. So you could say an orphan, what's the definition of orphan? And we'll put that where it should go. It shouldn't go in here, maybe it should, I don't know. I'm saying um, that I'm asking, is that the reason why a parent was removed from this policy? Yes, we, it, it was, um, so parents are mentioned in many of our policies and not all of them are defined. And there was a point in time, I think we were starting to put that in the, the committee just felt, well, maybe we don't need that. And, and again, my example with McKinney Vento was the unaccompanied youth, um, and w which could be addressed in caregiver because caregiver is very specific about informal kinship, but yes. But see, unaccompanied question, youth, if you have a caregiver, a caregiver, if a youth has a caregiver, then he's not an unaccompanied youth. If he has a foster parent, he's not a child without a parent because he's got a legally defined parent, a foster parent. So again, I think we're confusing the definition of... I'm not confusing anything. I just asked a question. No, no, no. no. Was okay. the word parent removed from the policy? The, the definition... To incorporate every student regardless of their parental situation. That's well, he correct. said for homeless students because we didn't have a definition. That's what he said the previous time. Right, homeless students. So again, we're talking about students and we're talking about parents. We're defining what a parent is in relation to students. We're not defining what status a student has based on whether he's adopted, he's an orphan, whatever. He's in a foster home or he's unaccompanied. Maybe we need a definition for all those in, in this policy or in another policy. But according to, for purposes of paragraph F, we're addressing what a parent is. And remember that parents, parenthood is not an all-inclusive thing. In fact, it's very exclusive. You have to be a parent, right? Foster parent, adoptive parent, step parent, biological parent, whatever it is. Or in some cases, uh, guardianship, by an older sibling or someone else, not even related. So I think if we start saying, well, it doesn't include homeless children. Well, homeless children have parents. In fact, a lot of them are homeless with their parents. So it, it's really, we're talking apples and oranges here. So we're, if, the, if the point is to come up with a definition of parent, and again, there's no legal authority that I see out there that says we have to have homeless or whatever incorporating the definition of parent. McKinney Vinto doesn't say that even remotely. Um, then the first place to go is the dictionary, a student's father or mother, or any other person legally recognized as responsible for the student and strictly limited to one of the following. And then the legal, legal accept, legally acceptable um, uh, means of being in parenti. Okay. Parenti loci, loci parenti. I I, I would ask if we would include the unaccompanied youth because we do have students that um, that are that are we have an adult acting on their behalf that do not fit any of these definitions. Okay. Um, That's the point. No, it's not the point. So that is the reason why. They hang on a minute. The, the right. Title. Right. Well, not no, because you, they weren't trying to remove the parent. They're just trying to incorporate all the students. Right. So I'm just thinking legally. If somebody comes into the school and says, hey, I want uh, student A's uh, entire record files, or I want to make medical decisions for student A, and you say, well, who are you? Well, I'm the neighbor, but he doesn't have parents, and I have a foster parent and everything else. Does the school do that? Do they act on those uh, medical recommendations, or do they act on giving him the records, private information of a student? Or does the school say, hey, you got to go to the courthouse and you have to get a guardianship or you have to get some kind of legal document saying that you're entitled to this because you fit the def definition of a parent. So F. for younger students, yes. To, and the example I gave are high school age students. And typically they act on behalf of themselves but may have a caregiver that is also acting on their behalf. And it-, it Well, they can so, if they're under 18, right? I mean, when they're over 18, they can request their own record, correct? They're but as, yeah. a, as a, again, with the McKinney-Vento unaccompanied youth, that's, that's where it gets gray. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think McKinney-Vento mentions anything about the de definition of what a parent is. Maybe it, it certainly uh, 
addresses homeless children and that homeless children are entitled to the resources that every other child is entitled to from public schools. You're correct. You're correct in that it does, and it basically addresses the rights of the, the child. And the child could say, I'm going to live with... Well, the child, the nine-year-old can say anything he wants or she wants, but until the court agrees, you know, if the nine-year-old is going to come into the, re in the saying, central telling, records and say, hey... Matt's specifically talking about high school students, so it's a little bit unique, not, not elementary right. students. We, we don't it, have that problem with elementary students because they do go to the courts, because they are. But you yeah. have a 16, 17, 18-year-old, and it's, it's a different case story. Um, I don't think that we're trying to be combative, and I don't, I mean, no. to me, yeah. if that, that, I don't have a problem with that going back in, but I do think right. that we do need to add the one additional piece, um, which is the McKinty Vento. So, we're not... May I ask well, how would you add that? But go ahead. No, it's okay if so, I ask board counsel. Sure. To yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so, you know, the I, I'm generally familiar with the McKinney Vento Act, and I um, generally agree with you know, Mr. Schiffnelli's assessment of it. You know, it doesn't. Act, it does actually include a parent or guardian. Um, the situation for a child who doesn't have a parent. Um, who doesn't live with a parent um, who is in the county, the way we determine the domicile of that child for the purposes of determining which school they go to is this informal kinship care arrangement, which is referenced in the stricken version under... That is number five. Five. five no. In, five. Informal caregiver. kinship care. So you know, that's what I would say kind of fills that gap of the situation that you're talking about and it's 7101c of the education article i'll just turn to that and that I've, I've dealt with that before where we have a child who's here the parent is not here they're living with a cousin who is not the legal guardian um there is an informal kinship care form with requirements and so that for the purposes of figuring out which school that child goes to and who that you know who do we send notes home to the informal kinship care arrangement which is covered in 7101c would be that, I think, that fills that gap that you all are trying to figure out. When, you know, how do we address those students? So it is included. I, in correct in I, concept, right? Kinship. Okay. So so we're good. In, in that situation, if it was a neighbor, let's say the student or a, a family friend, and they presented themselves at the school and said, "This child is homeless. So we want to enroll him. We they, we we are required to enroll that child." And uh, to do. If they're in a living arrangement with a relative of a child who's not the, you know, parent, they would complete that informal kinship care form and meet the requirements of 7101C1. It, would, it ha would have to be a relative, though. They can't. Hmm. That's, that's one of the provisions of the informal kinship care. Right. Re it is a relative, an adult related to so the child by blood or marriage. So if it's a neighbor, then that's not a relative. How is that covered? Hmm. I think that's what Matt's trying to get to, that we do have mm. unique situations that come up where there is no family member to accept Thank this you. child, and so there is a kind person in the community. And sometimes it's not, I mean, I remember a situation in a different district where it was a teacher that had no relationship with the child, you know, um, a formal relationship like blood relationship and stepped up and the child successfully made it through high school and graduated. And so we do have very unique situations mm. that wouldn't fall under that. I think Matt's got think okay. that perhaps there's a legal guardianship arrangement that we would have to respect, you know, in that, in that situation. So what if there isn't? Did that, did that, do those children then get excluded because they are not covered in this policy? No, because we're not talking about enrollment. Mm -hmm. I think that's a different it, We're not talking about, we're, we're talking about student discipline. Right. It's a student. Right. They may or may not have a parent. Yeah. And we want to make sure they are included. We're not trying to exclude the parents. I'm not either. So, in other words, this satisfies everything, including the kinship, where it's a relative. The only thing it doesn't satisfy is a total non-relative with no legal authority um, who, out of the kindness of his heart, is enrolling the child into the school, which is a great thing. What if it's and that's a child fine. doing it for themselves? Hang on. And that's fine. So, now, whether it's legal, I don't know. If we're actually... If we're obligated if we're by sharing, law to do that. Yeah. I'm obligated by what? I think we are obligated by law to do that. 
for if a, if an unaccompanied youth mean? presents themselves without any. I just and wonder, a 15 year old could just come in and if they're and say, and say I'm but homeless. But that's different. It's See, if you're emancipated, you're a ward of the state. Right. That's that's but different. Matt didn't say emancipated. He uh, just but, literally said a 15 year old comes in, says I am homeless. I have nobody to enroll me. We have to enroll that and child. I, yes, right. we do. But you can't deny them. Right. Not that this is talking about enrollment, I right, get that, sure. but yeah. the question was asked. Matt, did you want to sit? Yeah, I, I just Pamela, wanted, because I'll be working with Matt once we go back after yeah. tonight. Yeah. Does it does it make sense that either we have parent with the, like reinstate the strike through, change your parent, and then we have another definition like G, like this is F and we'd have to shift letters down, but sure. have a G that's unaccompanied youth and define that. Do that. Is that the, make the, rest of them the best of both worlds in this case yep. and, and there's so there'll be other policies that have these same right, exactly the we'll same need thing to update as well. and we'll have to have cut and paste it in all of them okay I hope I didn't that, confuse that, it. that's fine with me and again we're talking about these things unaccompanied youth they do need to be defined yeah. mm -hmm. somewhere yeah in the appropriate exactly. policy because mm -hmm. we're a school system talking about school kids so we so that we can bring something back next time maybe for action or more discussion should we move forward with reinstating parent as it is right now or the the new suggestion and you got if you want to so say we can, hold, well, hold I, on. May, I wouldn't mind going with what I, we talked about giving our ideas to mark he would assimilate it move it to dr salens for her review and and include the what you had said initially and then leave it i don't know if you do you do you want to tackle the unaccompanied minor section or do we want that to be miss uh, oh, mr yeah. evans and his team seems like leave it up seems to like the team something and... that warrants a little more research mm -hmm. certainly yeah. without a doubt well i i think and once then come back for another read yeah i'd be you know you have the school but then the, you know the, the, our board lawyer could if mark gets a uh, group of our questions send them to the lawyer let him review it Everybody's getting an idea of what we're doing, and he could, you know, go back and forth, not back and forth, come up with a mm -hmm. reasonable solution to solve this problem. Okay, so I think we're in consensus that, uh, yeah. It's clear you're as gonna, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna I'll, go back I'll, and I'll solicit. Yours. You're gonna you're gonna send it to I'll me. I'll solicit input. I'll give it to the team. We'll assemble it, and we'll add a G to Just it. Like and we'll give suggestions for I'll, G. But right. when are we including the board council? Are you gonna be sending your stuff to board council I, and then to you? Or I was gonna say I prefer to me to so that okay. we can work through okay. it, and then we'll send the final okay. draft to him. I can include um, Mark on that or uh, Mr. Schipanelli on that email when I send it to Adam for review. That's great. Um, great. And then Mark can weigh in if he doesn't think that I've um, properly, you know, pushed forward what the recommendation of the board was. I think oh, we got a good sounds plan. good. All right. Is Thanks. everybody comfortable? Any other comments? Okay, great, great. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Evans. And one more illness, uh, <laughs> uh, policy number 517, illness at school. This, it, this was the one that was com a complete rewrite. It was two sentences from 1993. And it was by our, our school health coordinator. Any comments or questions about the illnesses at school? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank thanks, you, Mr. Evans. Have a nice evening. All right. Uh, next, we are going to have Mr. Pinder with the building use. Thank you for that, by the way. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's right. Okay. Dr. Kill was ready to jump so in. So, Noble IT yeah. still at your service if necessary. You're up there now. It's all right. Um, He's not your problem anymore. <laughs> President Bennett, uh, Dr. Shalens, board members, uh, executive team, for the record, my name is uh, Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. Um, I was asked to share some information uh, pertaining to um, our building use within Queen Anne's County Public Schools and just to kind of give you an overview of how it was developed and why it changed in 2011. And believe it or not, I actually was around back in 2011 and pulled my lovely file out. 
Um, so policy 207, again, deals with building usage. Um, basically, there was one prior to September 5th, 2011, but to be quite honest with you, it was very vague. Um, at the time, uh, overseeing facilities w was realizing that um, there wasn't a really set amount that was being paid per different group. So one group might be paying this, another group might be paying that. There's really not a whole lot of consistency with it. Um, and again, to be quite frank, we were losing quite a bit of money um, running the buildings, and you'll see why here in a minute. Um, first of all, the, the building use, it's not to make money off of it. It's to help pay for our utilities, our consumables, and you'll, you'll see how we have it laid out here shortly. Um, it was revised, revised, sorry, April 6, 2016 um, by the board. They wanted to add a category G, which dealt with having a funeral or a wake for a employee or board member at that time at one of our high schools. The board voted to add that to the categories. Um, and right now I'm kind of going through the different um, sections of the whole policy and a little bit of a quick version. Um, the availability of the facilities, Basically, Julian Gottlieb handles the master calendar of all of the schools. So somebody contacts her to start the process of can they use the building, first of all. Then she'll go through to make sure there's no PTA meetings, there's no ban, there's no um, you know, conflict of interest. Um, looking at the categories of users, it starts out with like category A and goes to J. So basically category A, and it goes by um, first come would be and obviously anything that's related to the school. Um, second would be parks and rec. The third would be like federal state government. And then you keep on going down the ladder um, to like private groups. Um, churches also can um, uh, apply. The insurance, uh, they have to submit a certificate of insurance with um, a thousand dollar minimum amount to, for coverage. And then also a hundred thousand dollars for damage. Um, the requirements restrictions we have in there basically no gambling no fundraising no you know birthday parties things like that you'd be surprised what we get asked to accommodate um, we also have guidelines for indoor and outdoor facilities um, that just basically set forth what areas can be used we try to limit the classrooms because of the personal information that obviously are in there and we don't want you know people going in picking up reading things um, the application procedure is online. They, again, work through Jolene Gottlieb. She's been doing it for many years now. And then the fees and charge procedures I'll get into in a few minutes, but basically we made it a, a la carte kind of um, scenario where before it was, here's your one price. If you're paying that, okay, we'll take it. If not, we'll move on with it. Um, so the, the first question that we'll always get is why do I have to pay? Um, and then my kind of response is nothing's free. We're not looking to make money off of this. But just to give you an idea, the high school has a 350 ton chiller with a 50 horsepower pump, a 40 horsepower pump. And then as you can see, the fans for the, um, the air handler and then the exhaust fans. So that's actually $120 to run per hour. And going back to when we set the fee structure, we actually went through and analyzed back in 2011 each piece of equipment and what the cost was to run that at that time. How much, you know, how many horsepower it was, how many amps it was drawing. Um, so, again, to run that's $120. If we have a dance recital or somebody wants to rent the high school on a Saturday night, like at 6 o'clock, the temperatures are already in setback mode. So say it's up to 80 degrees, I, I got to bring that back on at 3 p.m., if not 2 p.m., to run. So then, therefore, I'm in the hole already, 300 and some dollars, just on electricity. Um, and as you'll see, hmm. it goes down a little bit. I, I just put on here a quick slide for the elementary. It, it's a smaller unit, obviously, therefore, when you're paying for that, in elementary school, if you want heat or air conditioning for an hour, it's $37. Middle school, $44. But what a lot of people don't understand, um, here's a residential unit, no comparison. And the most important part to understand, 
is that if it's 95 degrees out and 100% humidity, we're required to pull in 15 to 20% outside air. So all of that air you have to condition and wring the humidity out of, where at your home, you're using the same air over and over and over again. Um, what we're seeking to recoup um, basically are the operational cost. Um, and as I said, you have you know, electric propane, heating oil, water sewer. If you have 500 people there for a dance recital or 500 people there for some kind of other event, we're still paying for the toilet paper. We're still paying for the water, the sewer, and all of that. Um, that's the consumables I was talking about. The deterioration for usage on a weekend with Parks and Rec, you got hundreds and hundreds of kids playing basketball, indoor soccer. I mean, there is wear and tear on, on the facility. Um, damages and then also the uh, maintenance and custodial costs associated with it. So if you ever get a chance, you can look at the policy and the regulations, but I wanted to show you how we changed the fee structure and why we did it back then. Um, classroom is it's $14 to use, and as you can go through, um, $25 per hour for the gym, middle school, 35, on and on and on. Now, a lot of times people will take that and they say, I don't want air conditioning. I don't want heat, you know, because it falls within that parameter for us. And if it's right after school, it is shoulder months and it's going to handle that portion of it. So it gives the, the public an opportunity to, you know, use the facility, but, you know, still stay within the guidelines. Um, one of the things that we did change was we added a custodial fee um, because, believe it or not, well, you need somebody there to open a facility on the weekend and you need, they go through and inspect it to make sure it's in suitable condition. And then at the end of it, they obviously lock up and they go through and document anything that was, you know, damaged. Um, food service, obviously we have to meet the requirements of the health department. So basically when you're looking at you can pick and choose what you want to do. Um, building use invoices between uh, Jolene and the finance department, that um, those are created. And if you look at FY23, we were uh, 170,000. Um, FY24 so far, it's again, it's not finished. We're at 100, almost 69,000. But what I want to point out to you, back in 2011, um, we had basically three churches. We had three driver's ed programs. We had two daycares. We had GE um, classes. And to give you an idea, the daycares were averaging about 5,515 hours and not paying anything. Hmm. All right. The driver's ed programs, about 1,463 hours and not paying anything. Um, so obviously, when we changed the structure up, it we some people stopped coming. Um, we picked up other groups, you know, like travel teams and sports like that. But there's only so many hours you can use the building. I mean, because we have, you know, other activities. Um, what I will say is, when COVID hit and shut everything down, we haven't really seen the regrowth of, of using the facilities. Um, you know, churches we try to limit on a just for a one-year contract with them until they get situated, can move on. And, and the other thing to think about is you got custodians that, that have families, and you think about it, that's like an every Sunday commitment for a year round. Um, and sometimes getting that coverage is hard to get. Um, our biggest um, groups, uh, as far as payment we receive, Parks and Rec obviously pays uh, about $80,000 for the use of the facilities. And then um, Alpha Best is right below that. And then we have different theater groups and youth sports teams is basically how the revenue comes in. And again, it's not to make money. It's so that we're not losing money and maintaining what we have. No, Any thank questions? you. That's, no, it's great information. I do have a question. What does it cost to um, use the track? Because I noticed that some groups are using the track. What does that take to run? For the outside okay. portion of it, we don't charge anything. <laughs> um, with that, we try to incorporate that into um, when other programs are kind of going on, so it's obviously open. Um, years ago, when we installed the uh, Bermuda fields, everybody wanted to use them. And what was happening was 
they were getting worn down by the youth program. So then by the time football season came around or lacrosse season came around, the high school coaches weren't very happy. Um, so we've, we, we've eliminated all of that. Um, the only outside grounds they can use are the track or anything that's a, a non-Bermuda field. Thank you. Thank you. It's good information. The one thing is, I mean, we need to recoup our costs. I mean, understand Parks and Rec and people like that should be just what it costs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to make money, but they had 10 or 15% on that. It's not really covering our costs if you add that to it when you really figure all the incidentals we have. Mm -hmm. The county's changed somewhat over the last 20 years that there's more private venues that should be able to fill this need, and that's why they're in the private sector. We should not be competing against them. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, I have a, a thing where if it's Parks and Rec, if it's youth sports and stuff like that or, that are associated with the county, is one thing. When I get too far off that, it's the private sector should not, we should not interfere and be below what their rate is mm -hmm. to compete with them. And we can't afford to, to be doing this because we know what our costs are. I mean, it ha when's, does, it, does this go up two or three percent every year? No, that is something that actually we're going to look at over the summer of the rates just to make sure that we're meeting it. Um, we were supposed to go over that last summer and just, as you know, everything was crazy. Um, but it, it'd go up a few percentage points. Uh, These are the same rates we've had since when? 2000. Since 2011. Uh, well, then they're low. Um, so, yep. Sorry. I mean, I don't know if we should just put like a, I mean, uh, every, every year we have two or three percent in your costs. We have in, 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 in uh, employees and everything else. Mm -hmm. I would just don't think, I mean, a three percent increase and we've seen a lot more than that in a lot of places. Oh, yeah. well, I tell you, but, when we first went to this, there was a lot of people that were like, it's just outrageous. But then the community college, Chesapeake Community College and all started going, hey, you know, we're losing money here too on this. We need to make sure that we're, you know, recouping our cost on it. So they changed <laughs> theirs. Um, like I said, it gives them a chance to use the schools, but not, you know, not make a ton of Somebody keep an eye on. So one thing I've noticed um, by coming to a bunch of outside events at the school is um, I've been here a couple of times, Queen Anne's County to be exact, there's been hundreds of people there for like outside, you know, cheer, football, whatever, come in, and there's no food. So people are going over to Acme, they're going to McDonald's. Could we have like any of like the school groups or clubs like act, you know, put on the food and sell food and recoup money and make money that way because I mean I, I want to say one time last year there had to have been 500 people here and people were driving to McDonald's and asking us where there was food and that just the seems band, like the band does do that no each time football I was games, here there was, football football I think she's talking about outside yeah. like outside groups come, when they come in and like rent like Helen said the track or the field well there's absolutely but and the, I get what you're saying but then you also have to get the permits from the health department and all that stuff too uh, but I'll, right. I'll it, it is hard to find the outside groups that want even to even use like our own facilities. Like, so if we had a football game or something and you guys are selling food, they couldn't sell food at like have one of our school groups or clubs. Yes. Our school groups and clubs could do it. But what I'm saying is it, it is, it's hard to find the group of students that want to come out and, and do that all the time. Um, it's what I've seen. Uh, and just about my own two daughters in high school, you know, dad, can you sell stuff at the, halftime at the basketball game well you know none of the kids want to assist with that but they can outside groups can do that as long as they apply for like the permit for health department right. no i just meant for yeah. us making to but, make money yeah <laughs> i mean there's it, it is possible so many people but like i the other day i was at the first time i've ever seen it in many many years was at uh lacrosse game at the high school it was the first time i've never seen the um concession stand open right yeah uh, open? Nah. Yeah. um and you know just and, and when I look in there, I always see the same people, you know, that are putting in tons of hours all the time. So, um, you know, it is worth it, but it's just a, a commitment issue. Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pender. Thank you. And coming down the home stretch, we have expenditure status reports. Dr. Kibler. Sure. They're posted kind of filling in for uh, Ms. Gast this evening. Um, so can, I'm happy to try to answer questions, but also might ask to take things back to her too, just depending. Yeah, I 
Thank now that I've transitioned out of that hat for a few, <laughs> mo for a few months. Yes, and I have no questions. Yes, I'm here. Cheese. Spare you. Anybody else have any questions or I'm comments? Good, I got it. It was good. <laughs> About the reports? I mean, and this is a question for her, not you. Our numbers are mm -hmm. final on the 30th, yep. but we don't get everything back on, you know, to July. I guess, do, do, do you think we'll know a number in August, September, a, a pretty solid number of where we are for 24? Yeah, I believe we have to, because I think the reporting requirements with the audit in that, in that we really have to have things wrapped up for the auditors okay. so they can meet their own deadlines to, to submit to the state. By I just I just know with everything going on, I just, you know, kind of want to get you here behind us, know yeah. where we are. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Just, uh, I, I think we'll keep zeroing in on it. I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes with the various departments to try to get this figured out. Now that I, I was going to mention it before when we talked about the fund balance policy waiver, but now that that has been approved, there can be some amendments brought to the board for the budget transfers. We have not done that yet um, because like the hundred and anything that's over 100% right now can't mm. stay there because that's not what we initially budgeted for. So taking from one category, applying the fund balance to categories. So that, that'll be coming too in the coming co upcoming board meetings. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Um, we had scheduled a break. I'm assuming then was one a break. No, 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 All right. No, no. Any other? Uh, pardon? I think we're just about. Yeah, we probably well, just. I, well, you know, I had to, it was I think there. we probably need to remove that so because we yes. we had we moved things it, out yes. of the order. So we'll we'll take that up for next time. That was uh, our apologies. Anybody else for public comment? No, I don't no. see anyone. Okay. Future meetings and events. We have a work session on the 15th of May, 5 p.m and a regular board meeting on the 5th of June at 6 p.m. And graduation in a few days. Yes, and they were their students, that was one of their last things. Yes, 29th and 30th, I believe, yeah, are the two graduations. Yes. All right, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you very much.